I think I saw most of you yesterday in high school. At least a lot of you. I, with this poster up here, and what I really like most about this poster, beside it being one of my favorite movies, this is This Island Earth, Jeff Morrow, Faye DeMere, carried off to this awful But off in the upper right, This Island Earth, two and a half years in the making. <laughs> so two and a half years in the making, that, that, even the biblical people gave us 6,000. So, <laughs> man, you got to love Hollywood, right? <laughs> Let's cut to the chase. And one of the reasons I put this poster out is I'd like to start with uh, a voyage, really, a flight. Hero gets invited to this laboratory, and he's taken up in a little airplane. In about 2001, I got an invitation from, we have a very retiring person you probably never heard of by the name of Alan, Paul Allen. He's one of our Seattle best kept secrets, and he probably hasn't really gotten out of Portland, at least I hope in your sake he hasn't gotten to Portland. <laughs> so Paul said, please come up, and I get this black limousine, comes to my house, it's a cold November night, it's pouring down rain, get taken to Boeing Field, put on a little black airplane, now we're flying through the dark. We land at some island, go to his house, huge mansion, and there's about 30 scientists there. It's unbelievable. And he has invited all these people to come up to talk about a new science museum that he would like to build. Wow, this is great. So I get to meet the great man himself, and he is actually quite a wonderful guy. Sorry, Paul, if you're here. And as I walk up to him, he's talking to a blonde woman who's standing next to him, and they've got this animated conversation. And I brought a copy of my book, Rare Earth, and I wanted to give him presents. So I walk up to him, say, how do you do, Paul? I'm Peter Ward. And the woman turns and looks at me. And I put out the book. <laughs> and you've seen The Exorcist. It burns! It burns! <laughs> It's Jill Tarter of SETI. She grabs Paul and she takes him away. And, the, and I'm thinking, what did I say? <laughs> well, here's what I said. I said, if this book is right, all those people giving money to SETI may actually have been wasting their money. And she was putting the touch on Paul for $12 million as I walked up. <laughs> So what I want to do tonight is try to explain why it burned SETI and what really the chances are that SETI is going to find a signal. Now, my luck and my life being what it is, I guarantee tomorrow you'll open the paper and it will say, signal from space received at just the time we're giving this talk. But if it isn't, what I'd like to do is go through some of the reasons that I suspect we may not get too many of those signals. Now here's the lesson in communication, which makes me also somewhat pessimistic about the possibility of talking to other planets, because this is two intelligences, evil empires on Earth itself, a Microsoft operating system trying to talk to a Macintosh. <laughs> This was a slide my partner Don Brownlee made, and originally it did say bad and worst over there, but somehow going from his to mine, there was this communication breakdown. But the point of this slide, at least in our own solar system, that there's really only one good. And Mars is pretty bad, but as bad as Mars is, it doesn't hold a candle, literally, to a really bad planet, Venus. Venus is our twin, and if we could go back 4.5 billion years ago, Earth and Venus, I think, would have been very similar types of planets. Both of these are planets that have gone bad, and so now I don't want to talk about how and why planets go bad, I'm trying to get back at some sense of where can we find life in the universe. So let's do a little work first, and then we ended up with less work. But we've got to start with the work. We want to think about what a habitable planet is, and it's all dealing with, as any real estate agent will tell you, location, location, location. <laughs> but a better analog, I think, is Goldilocks. Goldilocks had that big chair. I think my eight-year-old son is here. Patrick, are you here somewhere? Hi. 
So over and over, I told this Goldilocks story, you know, and she goes in and she sits down and the big chair's too hard and the mama chair's too soft, and it's just right. And planet Earth is just right because of the distance from the sun. We call this the CHZ, the continuous habitable zone, and any star is going to have some distance from it where things will be just right. Well, you ask, what is just right? Well, just right is the existence of liquid water, at least for life as we know it, right? We'll get to life as we don't know it in about 10 minutes. But for life as we do know it, we need water. And for lots of life, we think we need water. So if you're really close to the sun, because stars get, they've got this nasty habit, unlike a, a, a campfire, you've been by a campfire, and over the night it burns down because you fall asleep, and you wake up and you're freezing because it's burned down. Well, stars, as they burn, get brighter and brighter and brighter. Who knew? And so you're getting burned up. And that's what stars do, and that's why planets very close to stars, like Venus, start okay and end up in really bad conditions. Our sun has increased its brightness, the energy hit in the Earth by one third since the start of our solar system. And as we get through this talk, we'll see that that increase will continue to our great misfortune down the road. So you want to be in the outer portions of a continuous habitable zone but being out there is also cold at the start. So that's kind of tough for life too. So we really have, we're thinking about planets now that are gonna be in some pretty narrow zone. So that's one type of habitable planet. The second would be moons of giant planets. Perhaps we could have a Jupiter, which is a really bad place to be because it's all gas, but the moon's going around it. That's the second possibility for habitable planets. Now, how long a planet remains habitable is a lot of what I'm going to do tonight and try to talk about. Short-lived habitability is a bad thing. And short-lived habitability happens when a planet has no mechanism for long-term temperature maintenance. And that is what happened to Venus. Long-term habitability can happen if you have what we call a planetary thermostat, and I'll briefly show what that is in a minute, or if you're orbiting a star that's really small, the dwarves, age so slowly that you can sit next to them for a long time, but there's a big negative about being close to a star. You become tidally locked, just like our moon is, always the same face. That's a bad deal for if you're living on the size of a planet. And it turns out most of the stars in our galaxy are dwarves. And so we think there cannot be any life on planets around dwarves. That knocks out about two-thirds of the stars in our galaxy, if that's correct, and that's not a very happy, SETI-friendly finding. Furthermore, Don and I in Rare Earth suggested that not all real estate is created equally. Those of you selling houses or buying houses know this all too well, and that in our own galaxy, and this, by the way, NGC 1433, we think is what our Milky Way galaxy looks like. We don't look like Andromeda. We are a barred galaxy. And so this is our best guess of our twin. So we have this bar, and where the green area is, is what we call the galactic habitable zone. And our particular star is located about in that green area down below. And the two parameters here are, first of all, you need metals. So metallicity, you need a lot of heavy stuff. You need radioactive elements to keep that furnace going. But the second is, if you're too close to the galactic center, a lot of bad things can happen to your planet. And we think as stars get closer together, they start pulling asteroids and comets away from other stars and blasting each other. We think the galactic centers are way too energetic, not just because of impact, but because of supernova and because of gamma ray bursts. Too far out, not enough metal, because it's the supernova that make the metal. Too close in, you get burned up. All parts of galaxies probably aren't created equally. And therefore, even the galaxies themselves are going to have places we should look for. So perhaps the real estate aspect of outer space isn't quite as friendly as the Enterprise and its crew would think. <laughs> this is what I think is the newest aspect that has really brought astrobiology awake about the contribution of geology. I was born and raised a geologist, spent my whole life looking at my feet. And what could one who looks at his feet the whole while ever contribute to the understanding of life in space? But it was a number of geologists who began thinking about this, plate tectonics. We just saw Mount St. Helens do its burp again. And that's directly related to subduction. And as stuff goes down, it creates 
lava that goes up, but what also goes up is carbon dioxide in huge quantities. And so when we have subduction like this taking place, we get this recycling happening. Well, on the other end, we have lava coming up in the middle of the Pacific at the start of these spreading centers. And so it's this recirculation of the crust that was found to be actually a planetary thermostat. Very interesting. Because as mountains rise, the silica magma erodes, and as it erodes and weathers, it affects the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If it gets really warm, you make lots of coral reefs, you suck down that CO2 until you've removed it from the atmosphere and you get cooler. When it gets really cool, you stop weathering as much, CO2 goes back up. This simple cycle, subduction, has allowed our planet to have liquid water for 4.5 billion years. A lot of us think the search for habitable planets in the universe is simple. You simply look for planets with plate tectonics, and you're going to know right away if it's habitable or not. It's that simple and that hard. How often do planets use plate tectonics? Boy, isn't that the $64 question. So we're learning more. We're understanding what keeps our planet habitable. We're 4.6 million or billion years in age. Origin of life is 3.5 billion about it. The suggestion that life happens so quickly on our planet makes us think that maybe it's easy on Earth-like planets. So let's think about the when, where, and how on our planet and start doing thought experiments about how else it could have happened and what else might have resulted. So this whole question of life is very interesting. and We might go back to this life as we know it and life as we don't know it. Rare Earth was criticized, but they said, well, you guys are talking about that special kind of Earth life, you know? It's not the Q, and it's not the silica life, and it's not the energy beam life, and on 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 and on. And so you really need to get a sense about what life is. Life metabolizes. Life replicates. Life evolves. That's the NASA definition. is pretty simple. Pretty simple, very complex to make chemicals do that. Microbial, metazoan, and intelligent, and of course intelligent is defined by SETI, is that you can build a radio telescope because otherwise you can't talk to them. And if, if you can't talk to them, they're not intelligent. That means William Shakespeare was not intelligent. Sonnets, don't cut it in this business. But as I pointed out in a class yesterday, if that's the case, if you're underwater, could any underwater civilization, let's say, the chief's intelligence ever be considered intelligent by this definition? Because underwater, it's going to be really hard to make electronics. You'd almost have to be a land-based civilization to talk to the stars. And so this definition of intelligence is itself pretty interesting. But let's start on our own life and go very quickly. About 3.5 billion years ago, we have pretty good evidence there was life on Earth. These small prokaryotes and bacteria are found in a wide variety of deposits. But it wasn't until, whoops, it wasn't until a half a billion years ago that we have evidence of animal life. And so this is a really interesting conundrum. We got life early, and then we took three billion years to go from one cell to five cells or a hundred cells. I mean, how hard is it to evolve a worm? <laughs> Either it's really hard or things were waiting for something to happen to get to where we build a worm. And then boom, we build a worm really fast because we had something called the Cambrian explosion. And we think that something is oxygen. This is my new mantra, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. It's an amazing stuff. And I'm writing a book about it now, what oxygen did. I think I can explain why there are trilobites. This is not in the talk, but I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> Don't tell. So trilobites have all these segments, right? And we had a guy, a friend of mine, who works on the Burgess Shale, so we got hold of really great Burgess Shale stuff. I got to go up there. And every segment of a trilobite has a gill beneath it. And if you measure the area of gills to the body of a trilobite, it's far higher than any crustacean today. It's far higher than almost anything. These things are all gills, because they have all these segments. Every segment has gills. Why do you have so many gills? Because there's very little oxygen when the Cambrian explosion happened. And as we got more oxygen, Life got closer to what we understand life being. But as I'll show you in a minute, we think there have been drops in oxygen and that these have had amazing consequences in the history of life on this planet. But anyway, I'm finished with that now. Okay, let's use Steve Gould's metaphor. Let's replay the tape. 
We start back at scratch and we ask, are we gonna get the same history of life? We're we gonna get the same life at 3.5 and then wait till 0.5 to get animals? Or will something entirely different happen? If we replay the tape, do we get DNA again? And I think this is one of the most profound scientific questions of our time. Is DNA one way or the only way that you can have an information storage system that allows life? You know, we can't answer that. We don't know. Our DNA is extremely specific. Not just the way the DNA is built, but what it does. Our DNA picks out 20 amino acids. You and I and everybody on this planet is made of 20 amino acids, no more, no less. They're always the same 20. That's phenomenal. If we replay the tape, do we get that same type of life again? Second question is, if life doesn't emerge after a certain amount of time, does the planet go bad? Do you have some window in which you have to get life, and if you don't get it, bad things happen? And the bad things that can happen is atmospheric? If you get enough lightning, it turns out, in an early world, in an ocean, you can start knocking nitrogen out of your system, and it gets replaced by worse stuff. Life takes care of that. So variable histories, it doesn't evolve, or it does, has a history and dies out. It evolves and it's exterminated. It evolves, it's exterminated, a new life comes. It evolves, exterminated, or is later receded. The universe is so vast, I don't think anybody in this room believes this is the only place with life. It's just too big, the numbers are too huge. Life's gonna be almost everywhere. So there are gonna be every one of these histories and many more out there. And I really think the joy of our particular civilization in our generation is that we're going to be able to really answer some of these questions within the next few centuries at least. Certainly quicker when we get to Mars. So on our own planet, one type of life evolves as a history, and my really great curiosity is how many types of life did form early on in planet Earth? Was DNA the first thing out of the gate and then held everybody else back? Or were like 15 or 20 types of DNA molecules duking it out? And this was the one that crawled up over the dead bodies of all the others. And we don't know the answer to that either. So types of life, there's DNA life, sort of life as we know it, and non-DNA life, which we can call life as we don't know it. And that's the title of a book that I'm publishing in November. I spent a long time thinking about what non-DNA life could be, and because I work for the NASA Astrobiology Institute, I had a lot of inside information in which looking at what their chemists have been doing, and it's both wonderful and scary because an alien life form has been produced several times now on our planet. An alien life form to me is life as we don't know it in terms of its DNA or in terms of some chemical structural aspect, and aliens are being produced. We just hope they're not being produced in the DARPA laboratories. So here's life as we know it. We've got this tree of life, three great units, Taxonomic entities, the bacteria, the archaea, the eukarya. This was discovered by the great Carl Woos in 1977. This particular tree first was published. But I think that this tree is not really inclusive enough to take care of if we find, for instance, life on Mars or for the life we're building in these laboratories that is indeed alien life. Where do you put it on this tree of life? And so I'm suggesting that we think about in a more expansive way, or more inclusive way, however you want to do it, categories I like to call arboreas, or trees. That the Earth arborea is carbon-based, but maybe on Mars, certainly if we find life on Titan, we could find other kinds, non-DNA life. And the possibility on Titan, the most exciting of all, is we find silicon life, this old trope of science fiction. It turns out you can make silicon life, and it could work at very low temperatures. And a number of people are trying to make it work now. They're called silanes. It's not pure silicon. It's silicon bonded with, bonded with carbon. But there's a number of very good reasons from chemistry and physics to suggest that there is a possibility of building these things. And if life could do it, you know, what do they say in Jurassic Park? Life will find a way as the guy gets eaten by the T-Rex. So I've penned this out, actually. This is what I think the actual tree of life on Earth ought to look like. Because personally, I think viruses are alive. And certainly we came through RNA life. The only way to get the DNA is through RNA. But the definition of life as we know it does not allow any RNA life. 
So we need a new category. I call it dominions. The domains are there. We just ramp up a new category, and the whole thing's an arborea. We're going to have to classify life as we build it or as we find it. So it's time to really start building the house, building the construct that will allow us to discover or build aliens. So we build a planet, we evolve some sort of life, alien life, our kind of life. How does habitability end? This is kind of the sad part of things, but as in our own lives, it's also liberating. The worst part about habitability, as we mentioned, is the suns get bigger, and as they get bigger, the planet moves out of the continuous habitable zone because it's no longer habitable. Secondly, there's a loss of the planetary circulation systems. You really can't analogize a planet to life in some ways, although I actually really am not a big proponent of the Gaia hypothesis. So we get a loss of these circulation systems of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, all of which have cycles. But the worst aspect is that it isn't sort of the gradual decrepitude which takes over you, which I'm feeling, but instead sudden or protracted accidents. Death from planetary accident as compared to planetary old age. And now the next part of this talk is look at both of these. So first, the fate of the Earth. Old age. I mean, that's the one we want, right? Social security still there. <laughs> the retirement accounts work. <laughs> Anybody got a stronger drink than this? I got it. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. So anyway, we're still alive. We're sort of decrepit, but we have enough money to survive, and then we die. So too with the earth. That's what we hope happens, right? Does anybody in this room want to, really want to sort of pass out and die right now? No, it's not your time. So it's not the earth's time. So old age is what we hope for, and just assume that we're just going to stay great till the end, and then it's over. But people don't age that way, and planets don't either. So microbes and metazoans, it's time to really think about the way life is divvied up on this planet. Microbes, of course, have a huge range of environmental conditions in which they can live, and metazoans, we, animals, and the complex plants, are much narrower. Complexity begets narrowness. Complexity begets the fact that you just can't take the really cold or the really hot like this good bacteria can. And so because there are such narrow temperature limits for animals, it requires a planet that's going to keep them to have a really darn good system of maintaining temperature. And more than that, it's got to maintain the elemental cycles that keep things alive. And the most important on our planet is carbon dioxide. The two things we have to worry about temperature and carbon dioxide. Now, paradoxically, I'm about to get fired from my job because I am a card-carrying professor. But I'm going to tell you that global warming is a good thing. <laughs> well, I'm also going to tell you 10 minutes from now that it's a very bad thing. The sophistry is a proud tradition in professordom. <laughs> Fate of the Earth, two things. It's going to get too hot and we're going to lose our carbon dioxide. So that's it, as simple as that. Which one comes first? Let's talk about carbon dioxide. Why do we need carbon dioxide? Well, that's the fuel of all of us, is what plants take. Sooner or later, every one of us is eating plant life. If we eat it by an animal, the animal ate a plant somewhere along the line. So we're eating plants. We're all vegetarians. That makes me feel much better. So I ate my steak last night. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> but the vegetarians need carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide is diminishing through time. Now, once you lose your plants, the oxygen necessary for life, for our kind of life, drops in about 20 million years. You need 10 parts per million CO2, and if you don't get that, you've got really bad, bad problems. So here's how we calculate it. A number of box models now are taking the most important aspect of really figuring out how much CO2 you have and what the temperatures are. And what we really want to know is the green box, global biological productivity. And this nasty diagram is how that is affected by stuff. There's negative feedback and positive feedback. But some very sophisticated mathematicians have taken the rock record of CO2, plugged it into these computer models, and made future predictions. And from it, they predict that carbon dioxide will drop to levels that plants can no longer use it in between 500 million years and a billion years. 
probably closer to 500 million. Well, that's a very interesting number because animal life started 500 million years ago, and if this model is correct, it's going to end 500 million years from now. We're exactly halfway through the age of animals. But what's unbelievably interesting is that it took so long to get animals in the first place. This is like having a kid when you're 85 years old. The planet is the equivalent of 85 years old in terms of life, and at the very end of it, it gets all these animals, and it's not going to last very long compared to the age of the Earth. Here's a graph suggesting how dire that is. The red graph is CO2, and this is for the last 500 million years only. Notice how it's right down there near zero right now. Well, when you look at a little finer scale, it turns out that we can continue going at these very low levels. But that's really the handwriting on the wall. I'm an advancing age, middle-aged man. It used to be I went to the doctor and he said, oh, like my little eight-year-old son, you're this tall, you know, we're going to figure out how big you're going to get, you're going to get this heavy, you're in great health, everything's cool. And then there's a certain point in your life where they start looking at you, and every year they go in, they're catching the downward sides of things, right? Oh, your cholesterol went up another 15%, and you're 50 pounds heavier, and your heart's worse. And now you... So there's this up and there's this down, and the earth, in terms of animals, unfortunately, is on this downswing. The loss of carbon dioxide is a consequence of this plate tectonics, and this is the bummer about it. We need it, it keeps us alive, and it's going to kill us because it sequesters the carbon in limestones. All those big mountains in the Rockies, those big white tall things near Banff, that's a lot of carbon dioxide we need, and it's stuck in carbonates. It gets on the continents, the continents don't subduct, so it sits there. That's where all the carbon dioxide went. Now the nice thing is we got these brains. We can get it out of there if we really need it. 500 million years from now, if we can keep civilization going that long, <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this really leads us to this view now. Here's the estimate of how things are going. The yellow is the age of animals. And off to the left is the first microbial age. And then CO2 disappears, and we go into, if we're lucky, the second microbial age. So we're an animal sandwich in between these two aureoles of bacteria. But the other deal we have to think about is sun's brightness. Now, that's the other nasty aspect here. I told you two things are going to happen. One is CO2, but the other, the sun, that darn sun, it keeps building this fire more and more and more and more. And this is because of physics, because the hydrogen burns the helium, and the helium is now filling up that ball of our sun. And to keep the same size, more energy has to go out because of all the darn helium. If we could get a little spigot and helium it off, Maybe to Venus or something. You know, can you just see the little tube around? There goes the helium. I don't know. But the problem is that there's going to be heat problems. The heat problems for us are shown here. These are the absolute limits in centigrade at which animals die. And maybe evolution, future evolution, will push us to be able to withstand higher heats. I'm sure there will be a lot of evolutionary push and sway, but there are limits to this. Look at bacteria, 113 degrees and climbing because people keep finding these extreme files. But the animal world is really, you, you hit up near 50 degrees centigrade, and that's about it. And that's because mitochondria just shut down at a high temperature, and you've got to have those. So there is a limit to the temperatures we can withstand. So this is where the other bad news. There is a solution. The government has proposed a solution. <laughs> now, let's say we want to move the Earth because it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. How would we do that? Well, we can. If we go to the asteroid belt and we get giant asteroids and we fling them at the Earth and have them just miss, when that happens, the angular momentum pulls the Earth out just a little bit. And if you throw in the asteroids two or three billion times, we could just move it out gradually and be saved. You can't screw up, though. <laughs> Nobody like, you know, I live in Lake Washington. We've lost two floating bridges. One across Lake Washington because an engineer went home on a Friday night and he wanted to get home and he forgot to close the stopcock. 
and the $500 million bridge or whatever it was went I took my little son out to watch this and I said, you can't screw up. <laughs> he got a pension in China that would have shot him on the spot. So what happens when it gets hotter? Two fates of the ocean. We hope and we hope not for one of these. We hope for the moist greenhouse and we hope we don't have the runaway greenhouse. So a billion years from now, the temperatures go high enough, forget the CO2, when we lose the oceans, things get really nasty, as you can imagine. And it's not that they boil away, it's just when global temperatures sit about 50 degrees, 60 degrees centigrade in the upper atmosphere, <laughs> hydrogen splits off the oxygen and heads off into space. And there goes your water, your seas actually head off into space. And so this is gonna start happening in about a billion years from now and the Earth is gonna lose its oceans. And so this is a estimate now where this happens. The ocean's loss begins perhaps at five to five and a half billion years after the formation of the Earth. Somewhere right after the end of plants, perhaps about the same time, but that is it. You know, none of us are gonna live to 200 years in age unless some of you young kids, maybe we will figure that out, but most of us aren't. You know, we have a certain amount of time and science is really good. We're really bad at the near-term predictions, but the far-term predictions, at least on what the sun is doing and CO2, it's pretty easy to calculate these things. So this is real, this is the hard work. We wrote up this in a book called Life and Death of Planet Earth. It sold four copies. <laughs> It's so depressing. People said, you're trying to make me pay money to read this stuff? <laughs> Forget it. So here's what we get in the end. The second microbial age, this comes from near Hanford. These are bacteria and basalt. And that's what the Earth, if it's lucky, if it's lucky, if we don't have runaway greenhouse, we get this maybe for a few other billions of years. But then there's an end to it all. And the final end of the Earth happens 12 billion years after its inception, so seven billion years from now. And it expands rapidly after this long, slow increase, it goes red giant. So the final 250 million years can be shown in this panel. The first nasty thing is, is that the lunar surface begins to melt and the Earth and the Moon glow. So at this time, we go to Europa, because as my friend Don Brownlee, who put the slide together, says, it becomes like Maui, and Maui is our favorite destination, so why not? So we'll move out to Europa. But the, really, the end of the world, at least for planet Earth, happens soon after that, and happens right about here, one of these last perturbations takes place, and the Earth gets assimilated. The sun moves out to the orbit of the Earth, and so we get crisped. So that is the end of the Earth, unless we use this NASA system of moving the Earth out its end is ordained in that particular fashion. And this is what's left. <laughs> we made hundreds of these postcards. We sent them to our friends. <laughs> and a lot of them came back no longer at this address. <laughs> There's no humor like sick scientist humor. <laughs> All right, let's go to the even worse possibility. We don't make it old age, but in fact, we die an early death. So let's go through that nasty little business. The Earth's history has had in the last 500 million years some nasty near-death experiences. We call these mass extinctions. Where are they? I rest my case. There have been mass extinctions. They have utterly changed the nature of life on this planet. They've been good things or bad things, depending upon whether you'd like to have a world still with dinosaurs, which we all would, of course. But on the other hand, if we had a world still with dinosaurs, we may not have had this lovely conversation. And I'd rather be here with you tonight than in that type of world. How do we know the dinosaurs died out? Well, this is how we know that this really is a problem for planets because this was an impact extinction. This is the site in Italy, Gubbio, where Walter Alvarez and his crew, this is one of his grad students, discovered that we had evidence of being hit, that mass extinctions up to 1980 were really considered to be sort of climate change things. But this is the layer itself. And what's fascinating about this picture to me, you see the rock hammer for scale, you see the white rock and a little red thin line. Well, that red thin line is full of iridium and spherules and tectites, it's pieces and bits of Mexico 
Now in Europe, this is a European picture. And then the black rock above it is what happens when you kill the plankton because all the white rock beneath that red line, that's all full of the stuff made, the chalk is made of. So we had this wonderful world, rich world, and then bang, it comes to an end suddenly. And then the black rock is sedimentation in the absence of any plankton. At the top of this picture, we see some white rock again because the plankton revolves. This was a nasty catastrophe. This is killing the dinosaurs in a month now, at most. This is not some protracted thing, and this is not a world that saw it coming. These guys didn't have Bruce Willis and space shuttles. <laughs> ben Affleck was not there. Here's what we see in terms of the little guys. These are planktonic, planktonic foraminifera in the last few centimeters before the end of the Cretaceous and the first few centimeters of the tertiary, and we go from about 55 species to one. We see this iridium in placement that's coincident with the extinction in these data, and to the biota of the time, it would have been a very nasty, if colorful, event. <laughs> we know where it is. We see the crater has been discovered in the Gulf of Mexico region. This is in Yucatan. The white line is the tsunami deposits. Unbelievable, because this was hit in very shallow water, a few tens of meters, so a seven to 10 kilometer body hits in there and creates enormous waves, kilometer high, picking up all those dinosaurs. T-Rex. <laughs> I went to Italy, and some Italian stood up and said, would that have gotten Crawford? <laughs> <laughs> well, are you copying because it wouldn't have? <laughs> <laughs> missed, it missed, it missed. <laughs> Uh, the problem is, once we discovered that one of these mass extinctions was caused by impact, we thought all of them were. But in the year 2000, we discovered that that's not the truth, and I want to show you a couple of things. Uh, we think mass extinctions could be caused by asteroid or comet impact, nearby supernova, or gamma ray jets. I've proposed my first and only screenplay. It's been roundly rejected. And it's a story where we're on planet Earth, and a nearby neutron star burps gamma rays. We know they do this, they do it in jets. And it's probably pretty sure that if you're in line of being hit by one of these jets, your planet will be sterilized. We were hit several weeks ago again. We were hit, I think it was 97, 98, and knocked out five satellites. So these things are blasting through space. This is another reason you can't be in the middle of a galaxy. There's too many of this stuff. So let's just say planet Earth has one of these go by closely, whoosh. Remember the old neutron bomb? What idiot thought that one up? Carter, one of those guys, back in the Carter days, they were gonna bomb cities where the neutron bomb never blew up any of the stuff, it just killed all the people. Well, that's what these things do. So my screenplay was, one of these things hits the Earth and it utterly, utterly sterilizes that part of the earth facing the beam, and the other half's fine. So you wake up, and you know, I'm no fool. I had it hit the eastern hemisphere. So our hero wakes up, and he's calling his friends in China. But guess what? Nobody's answering the phone. Who would own all the stuff? <laughs> I think about it, you've got half the world and they're all gone. Who owns it? Is it the expatriates? And we saw the Iraqis go back, we own this country now. So that's one bad thing that can happen to you. And supernova is another bad thing. So these are the things that could end a planet's existence. I mean, this is real stuff. Big comets are the worst because they come in three times as fast as asteroids do. Big comets are by far the worst. Comets go really fast. Supernova, the lethal radius is about 30 light years. If you're within 30 year light years of a supernova, your ozone is gone. So you really need sunscreen two million. <laughs> That's a bad one. 
So we started thinking, those of us worrying about what kills things, and we came up to this conundrum. We could only find one of the mass extinctions that seems to have been caused by impact. And that takes us to the worst of all, one that I just published on in science. I got myself in real trouble over it, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Surprising, eh? And this is the one at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago. This is the worst. At this time, the continents were all together. When I was a graduate student, We were taught that this was caused by the fact that it was so hot and so cold. And then I got my first job. i have grown up in Seattle, born in the Northwest. I always loved Portland, though. This is always vacation. We came down here and drank to excess and then dragged our headaches home. But then I went to Ohio. And I had never seen snow that lasted more than a single day, ever. And I went to a place where it snowed and it stayed and stayed, and everybody had dogs, and the dogs would crap in the snow, and it got frozen in, right? So I went through my first winter in Ohio, and then this March day, the thaw happened. <laughs> <laughs> Who could live there? <laughs> so that made perfect sense to me, because the continents were all together, and you had this super Ohio effect. <laughs> of course things died. It's too hot in the summer, it's too cold in the winter, and every March, dog crap from six months <laughs> covers everything. I had to get out of there. So I worked on what killed the dinosaurs for a while, and then I moved to South Africa in 1990. To get at this wasn't really the Ohio effect, but by 1990, we were all convinced, oh man, if there was an asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, there was a big asteroid, big, get it, big asteroid that killed the, uh... <laughs> we had our priorities. <laughs> and there are some unbelievable cast of characters that got killed off by this 250 million year old event. And this is a Gorgon or a Gorgonopsian the skull is about a meter and a half. These things were monsters. I mean, really cool, great, moving monsters. You know, who do we want to kill with a Gorgon? You get to see the, we've all seen the movies, right? They, somehow it comes back to life and it's stalking somebody and blah, blah, blah. But it would be a great creature to see. It's unlike anything that any of us have ever imagined before. This is a mammal-like reptile, by the way. As nasty as it looks, this is your ancestor. So don't get too up in arms about it. <laughs> this is my son. This is paleontological child abuse. <laughs> there was a huge and unknown fauna of creatures killed off by this mass extinction. In the crew of South Africa, which is really a fabulous place to work, there's over 60 species of these things that die out. And we went there thinking asteroid impact and walked away scratching our heads. This is one of the bigger ones, but there's big ones, small ones, all kinds of stuff. But the point is, this is 250 million years ago. This is way before anybody imagined dinosaurs. And these are mammals. They don't have the same ear bones that mammals have or the same palate, but they're right there. They probably had hair, probably live birth, suckled their young. In every other way, these are perfectly good mammals. The Asia dinosaurs was a terrible mistake. It should have never happened. And it happened because these things died out. And so this really is an enormous, interesting equation. This is where they die out. This is one of the sites in South Africa. And what we're seeing here, see the stripy rocks? You don't see stripy rocks on this planet very often. We geologists, when we find rocks like this, we understand, huh, something interesting's happened there. Because sedimentary rocks in any place that has oxygen have animals in it, and sedimentation gets disrupted. It's called bioturbation. You don't see rocks like this. This is the Permo-Triassic boundary. The last Permian creature is right at the base of this little draw. The first Triassic is right above it. That whole hill behind is all Triassic. So 250 million years ago, 90% of the species died out on the planet. And the last of them made it up to these stripy beds. The reason they're stripy is we killed off all the bugs and stuff that burrows through sediment. Not only did we do that, we killed off most of the plant life. This was a horrible, horrible, horrible event. It dwarfs what happened to the dinosaurs. 
Here's the line in the sand now. We're looking at the Permian and the Triassic, and this is how we sort of bookkeep the stuff. And we see right this red line, all those sort of terminations. Well, that's, that's it. You know, this is like a Civil War battlefield. So what caused the red line? The red line, cut to the chase, seems to have been caused by global warming. Now, the Earth has some nasty habits of its own. You really don't need asteroids and bad stuff to kill planets. It looks like planets could do it to themselves. Planets can be bad to their life. This is our planet. We've now moved all the rock away. And these are where we have lava flows, flood basalts, coming out of the mantle itself and moving, or actually from the core, and moving through the mantle right to the surface of the planet. Huge flood basalts, eastern Washington, northeastern Oregon, huge areas where enormous quantities of basalt bubble out. I mean, it doesn't blow up like St. Helens. It just bubbles out and releases unbelievable quantities of carbon dioxide. Now here I'm telling you, we're losing our carbon dioxide, it's gonna kill us. Well, you got too much carbon dioxide, it does the same thing. It's all a balancing act. These red points are where these flood basalts have spilled out. The biggest one, as you can see, is set up there by the 120. That's the one in Siberia called the Siberian Traps. These are all different ages, but that one big red one happened all at the same time over a short period of time, 250 million years ago. We've back calculated what happened. Enough carbon dioxide came out of the Earth at this time to radically heat the Earth. 10 to 15 degrees centigrade, the whole Earth heats up really fast. The nasty thing about lots of carbon dioxide, when you get lots of carbon dioxide, it drives your oxygen down. Ooh, here's what oxygen's doing now. We're at 21%. Look at that thing happening between 300 and 200. That's when it drops down to about 11%. That's bad. You're at 17,000 feet of your 11% oxygen. If you're at 2,000 feet, you're dead. So the only thing that survived was at sea level. That's enough to kill stuff. So the lessons are that metazoans are fragile. We're now looking at greenhouse extinctions, is what I called them. I wrote an editorial in the Seattle paper, and I started getting essentially death threats. Unbelievable. People saying, you know, you left-wing fuzzy asshole. Is it, how could you say that global warming could hurt anything? There's no global warming, and on and on and on and on. But it really does look as if planets, not only planets, but our space does things, and that we animals are extremely fragile. So to begin to conclude, I'd like to talk about how common is plate tectonics because that's one of the deals about the frequency of life in the universe. Secondly, impact rate. We only got hit once to cause any sort of consequential destruction. We're getting hit all the time, but only one bad one. Now one of the points that worries a lot of us, and I told this to the two high schoolers I talked to yesterday, and I hate, hate to repeat myself, but you know, doddering old age does that. What would happen if a 50 meter object hit the Earth's atmosphere over New York City tonight? In 1906, a similar sized object hit the atmosphere above a place called Tunguska in Siberia, and it flattened many square miles of trees. The energy released was the equivalent of a small hydrogen bomb, because 50 Meters is about the size at which an asteroid comes down and compresses the atmosphere. It doesn't go all the way to the Earth. It smacks into denser and denser atmosphere and finally fragments as an airburst. But the airburst causes pressure downward. It's the equivalent of an airburst nuclear event. If that were to happen in New York City tonight, can you imagine the phone calls? George, New York City disappeared. Give me the code for Tehran. <laughs> what do you mean there's no radiation? <laughs> this is a true scenario. A lot of scientists are extremely worried. How do you get to somebody in government if we had an airburst because it mimics a hydrogen bomb attack? Except there's no radiation. But who's going to worry about that? You flattened a city. The city is gone. Seven million people are dead. Just boom, they're gone. Because 50 meter bodies, we can't see them. I mean, all the space watch we do, you can't see 50 meters. 
It just comes out of the sky and boom. Every 100 years, we get hit by a 50-meter object. It hit Tunguska last time. You know, the world's getting more crowded. We have to have some system to immediately call somebody and say, well, it was just an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bomb anybody, George. <laughs> Let this one go by. <laughs> And the reason we don't have much impact, we've got these little things, but the big ones that kill dinosaurs are rare on this planet because of Jupiter. In a great pioneering study by George Wetherill in 1995, he said, look, if we did not have Jupiter, the impact rate on planet Earth would be hundreds to thousands of times higher, and his calculations suggested a KT, Cretaceous Tertiary Impact Level event, every million years instead of every 100 million years. When you're hit every million years by bodies 10 miles in diameter that create 200 mile wide craters that cover the earth, that burn up all the forests, life has a hard time recovering. It gets going and boom, and up you go, and boom, and up you go, and you know, over and over and over. And after a while, you lose animals. It's the impact rate that's going to affect habitability. How often can we find systems like our own that have Jupiter way out there? That's the most interesting question now. We can see the systems with our planet detection events that have close Jupiters. We can barely detect systems like our own. We can now, a couple years ago we couldn't, but we can now, and we're starting to find a couple. But it still looks like far more systems have close in Jupiters than far out Jupiters, and close in Jupiters are really bad such that we now talk about good Jupiters and bad Jupiters. <laughs> we have a good Jupiter. Stay out there. Push those asteroids away. Bad Jupiters. If our Jupiter wanted to come in and get warm, every planet inside it would get knocked out or into the sun. And bad Jupiters have done that. How many planetary systems we see with those close in Jupiters, had Earth-like planets, with life started, and in came the Jupiter, and out went the planet with the life on it, or into the sun, and probably many. Jupiters migrate inward. Ours didn't. How rare is our planet? We're just now finding out. You gotta have a lot of stuff working for you to get to the point where William Shakespeare can be considered unintelligent. <laughs> so here's what I think we need for advanced life. Temperature stability, time, good Jupiter, enough water, but not too much, not too much. Kevin Costner, bad movie, bad hair, bad planet. Luck, luck's good, and a good neighborhood. Cause for hope. I was told yesterday, the second of my talks, I ended on a little bit of a negative point, so <laughs> I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> what just happened? What just happened 12,000 years ago? 12,000 years ago, if we could look out the windows here, lost them all. Funny, that's when the humans got here, or at least the humans with the Clovis tips, because at about that time, we start finding these in the records. Humans certainly got here before that, in South America and a few other places now, rock shelter, we're finding a few evidences that humans had gotten here, but a new sort of band of humans came down with mega mammal hunting weapons. This is a Clovis Point, some of the most beautiful were found in the town of Wenatchee. It's funny, I was driving back, went to Canada Beach today. You, you Oregonians live in about the prettiest state of the planet. So we went to the beach, came back, and somebody called up and said, he just come here, and the radio guy said, Wanichi, and I knew I wasn't home. <laughs> the other one we have is Puyallup. You probably have your own. No non-native person can say that. So we have these in Wanichi, some beautiful points, and we find them with the mega mammals, and there's no doubt that we have produced some of the mass extinctions. These are the big animals we've lost on the planet so far. For some pretty cool stuff. And it turns out that the introduction of humans to these continents always resulted in the loss of large animals. Now our future is uncertain, and most uncertain is climate. 
So this is New York City from my friend and artist Alexis Rockman, sort of looking at the two fates of Central Park, and on the right, the global warm jungle of Central Park, and on the left, oh, the ice came down again. Because you can certainly see in Central Park on those rocks, the scratches and the striations. I mean, there's no doubt there has been glaciers. Our job is to make sure that neither of these happen. The job of our children is to make sure that neither of these happen. We are seeing a huge failure of leadership in this country concerning climate. And there may be no more dangerous thing facing us than just saying, oh, it's not happening. It is happening. Just as planets have to have a very narrow temperature range, we as an industrialized civilization have to have an even narrower temperature range. Glaciation in our future? I hope not. A glaciated world is a disaster for us. The biggest worry is that global warming kicks us back into glaciation because we change rainfall patterns, turn it into snow, it changes albedo, and we're kicked in. I mean, let's face it, what keeps you out of global warming or out of glaciation is CO2 rise. You've got to have just the right amount of CO2 rise. But if you have too much of it, you kill things. The Permian animals were killed by CO2. So I love this. This is from an uh, oil company in South Africa saying that we won't do anything about extinction over our dead body. But you know, the, the truth is that we all need industry, we need technology, but I'm, I'm worried that any time an intelligent civilization arises on any planet, there is a mass extinction. I think as we move from non-industrial to industrial, we, like little children, clumsily knock things. And in our own case, it has been through agriculture killing so many species. And so we really have a lot of dire warnings about what's happening. Quarter mammals face mass extinction. You know, this is too beautiful world, and perhaps too rare world, that I don't really want to see it emptied out. Thank you. Questions, please. I have microphones. I guess there's microphones that you can get to. I used to say you get what you pay for, but some of you may have paid, so I can't say that. <laughs> Since I usually do this for free. So, go ahead up above. Okay. Um, so, I, uh, some people say that, the, that some, like, creatures lived through the extinction of the dinosaurs and if it was so big how could they survive yeah that's a great 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 question how could anything ever survive such a catastrophe because when that rock hit in the yucatan it blew up an awful rock in the space and one of the great killing mechanisms were small bits and pieces of the crater the stuff that was in the crater coming back down at ballistic speeds and setting plants on fire we find a carbon rich layer so really the survivors appear to be those that could burrow and those that live paradoxically in fresh water. But the most interesting survival pattern is small size. Being tiny, being buried, or perhaps if you live in the ocean, being deep sea. Those are the particular creatures that get through it. Yeah, because it said that um, some of the creatures, like they say that some type of creatures haven't evolved or changed since the dinosaur era. Yep. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, my favorite animal is the chambered nautilus. I began my career studying that, and it hasn't changed a bit. It's a very great deep sea animal. Okay, I've answered your question. You answer mine now. Once you become a scientist or an engineer. <laughs> sure. Can anybody in this room think of a more important national security aspect than our producing scientists and engineers in huge quantities? I think that's the greatest single national security aspect we face now, is producing what it is. More questions, please. Um, there's been some reports that the, I guess what they call a super volcano in Yellowstone is coming back around to its cycle. Any idea how that would affect at least North America, if not the global 
Yeah, great question. I, I, I had a really crack up last year because the state of Washington named Mount St. Helens the biggest single polluter in the state. <laughs> Which goes to your question. I was kind of really curious about how they would find it, but then I remember the EPA doesn't find polluters anymore, so the mountain got away with it. <laughs> Good administration to be Mount St. Helens this year. Uh, volcanoes don't worry me too much because any one volcano doesn't really produce enough bad gas to do things badly. It's these big flood basalt things. And flood basalts take place over tens of thousands of years. So uh, your question is a really good one. A lot of people are really worried if we have increased volcanic activity and if we do get this enormous buildup. I mean, what it really affects, of course, is the local population and the fact that we have so many farms that we depend so much on agriculture. Where local volcanoes can really do bad things is when you get super explosions that affect climate. And the problem with our civilization is that we are so precariously perched on the absolute need to have bumper crops. We have so many people on this planet, we cannot have, as when Krakatoa went, they had a year without summer, we can't have that. Can you imagine if crop yields drop 40 or 50 or 80 percent in one year, how would we feed everybody? You know, we, we just can't afford to have a failure, and that's what a super volcano could do, and that's the biggest danger. I hope I got your question yes, answered. You. Oh, here's some. Question, what would tell us that a mass extinction was caused by a supernova or a gamma ray burst? Boy, great question. Where's that, whoever wrote this, come see me. I want to take all the good Oregon students up to Washington. That's my job here, to steal your young from you. And train them and not turn them into those green and yellow ducks. Great question. We're looking, we're really fighting over this. What would a gamma ray burst do? And a gamma rays would, it would we'd have to leave an isotopic record and people are looking at, uh, I think it's molybdenum, I can't say it, molly, <laughs> and iron isotopes. We think when it hits, it changes some of the iron isotopes or it kills things. But it, there isn't really much of a chemical signature because you're dealing just with a lot of radiation coming down and it doesn't really leave a record as an asteroid impact does. So supernovas and gamma ray bursts are going to be rather invisible. Uh, the suggestion is when you do the calculations, there should be three or four supernovas within the lethal radius of the Earth over the last 500 billion years. And you can calculate, back calculate this from the fact that we're like going around on a merry-go-round. And so we're passing lots of different stars. And every once in a while, stars go off. So that 30 light year radius should have us passing through it. Not very often, but every 150 million years. We have five mass extinctions, one of which we can explain. The Permian extinction, I think, is greenhouse gas, the Triassic probably, but the Ordovician extinction, the Devonian extinction, and then the many small ones we have no answer to. We know of only one impact extinction. Now, this is the great surprise of the last five years. That's why I love science, is that unexpected stuff happens. No time to retire. Um, there's somebody at the microphone. You want to ask a question? Um, I was uh, watching the uh, Mars rover thing uh, at the beginning, and I was just kind of thinking about how they were looking for the kind of life that we have on Earth, and they weren't really thinking about the different kind of life that could be on other planets, like uh, life that doesn't need water like liquid water or oxygen or our kind of climate? Uh, how old are you? 11. Okay, five more years, University of Washington. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take you young. That's a great, great question. And if I were your age, I think the most exciting thing that's happened in recent time is what NASA has done. I mean, this is what they pulled off on Mars, but then Titan, I mean, that they pulled it off on Titan is just totally mind-blowing. To see what came back from Titan is extraordinary. And what we're doing at the University of Washington, we have a program called Astrobiology. We're trying to teach people to be broader instead of the narrow, narrow deep scientists that we've been producing for a long time. We're trying to get them to be sort of broader thinkers. It's really hard because we were all trained to be narrow thinkers. But your questions are really broad ones and really interesting ones and ones that I worry about 
and it's kind of too late in life for me to get trained to the point where I could probably answer them, but you could. <laughs> so, I mean, I become an astrobiologist. What could be cooler? <laughs> Mike on the left side. Yes, I wondered if you could uh, briefly um, explain how Jupiters decide to move in and become bad, and like, could our Jupiter decide one day to be a bad Jupiter? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. It, it's, as you know, all planets, they don't, they don't go in circles, they go in ellipses. And it's, our planets luckily have a very low eccentricity, unlike some of the people that you listen to in these lectures. <laughs> Meaning they're close to circularity. But when you have planets that are in funny orbits, and I mean, look what Neptune is doing. And look what Pluto does. I mean, there's some strange stuff going on in some of the orbits out there. Our orbits are pretty well behaved, but not entirely so. And if you have some eccentricity in some of your big gas giants, enough to affect each other very slowly over time, they knock stuff out of orbit. Gravity is a funny thing. I mean, it works over very long periods of time. And very slow, gradual changes eventually produce huge catastrophic changes. Our own system seems to have been stable for a long time, but also we've got to explain what's going on with that moon of Neptune, which may crash into Neptune in the next million years or so. It has captured something. It has captured something new. It's perturbed something. When we saw Jupiter capture Shoemaker Levy 9 a couple of years ago, this was the best, I think, uh, so amazing in our lifetimes, we saw exactly what George Weatherall was talking about, that these Jupiters capture stuff, their gravity does it. But planets capture each other. And when they do so, if they push them just a little bit, then it's woe betide the smaller gravity stuff. And so the whole history of our solar system isn't written yet. Thank goodness. Over here. Okay. Um, you, sorry, that's really loud. Early on, you discussed how rare Earth is in the zones that we have to live in, temperatures, water, you know, all the plate tectonics, that, plate tectonics that occur. I was curious, in relation to the rarity of the Jupiter moons, Titan, which might also hold life, given processes, even the life as we do not know it, I was curious, in your perspective, how rare are those compared to Earth, as a galaxy kind of sense goes? Well, I think the galaxy is just totally infected with life. And infected is a good word. I mean, our planet is infected with microbial life, and it would take an awfully strong antibiotic to get rid of it. But I don't think the universe is infected in a similar fashion with higher grade animal stuff because of the narrowness of adaptability. But once again, you know, just, and the very good criticism of this book, which I have to take back or I get arrested, this wonderful night ends in chaos for me. Uh, one of the Wonderful things we're realizing is that you know, it doesn't have to be life as we know it, and perhaps animal life made from totally different systems has much wider adaptability. The other aspect is we always think about life taking place at our own pace, but life in a cold chemical system might be moving absolutely so slowly that we don't even know it's life. You know, really slow molecular chemical changes, but still fulfilling the various definitions of life. So that's going to be the challenge. The big challenge now is to put something on Europa, for instance, and go through the ice and get down to the ocean. But how are you going to look for something? What are you going to look for? Are you going to look for Earth life? What sort of probes do you make to look for life on Titan and Europa? I'm really sad. I think I'm not going to live long enough to really see the full exploration of those moons. And I think our, our species is going to really explore the solar system over the next few millennia. And I suspect we'll find wonders. I'm very bullish. I think there's going to be microbes on Mars. I think we're going to find some really strange alien life on Titan. It's going to be so cool. That's why I say be an astrobiologist. You young kids, man, you get the world at your fingertips. Just study science. Obey your parents. Put the dishes away. <laughs> Brush your teeth. Patrick. More questions, please. Any more? Yep. Way up. Hi. Uh, there's a, been a tinge of uh, political nature in the conversation. I, and I I'm just, a guilty. I'm sorry. That's quite all right. I'm, I'm not just sorry. Uh, curious about what your thoughts are on making policy about carbon dioxide and temperature changes using computer models when they haven't, uh, haven't been able to predict anything 5, 10, 15, 20 years. 
That's yeah, right. uh, that's a really great question. I can sit here glibly because I have the microphone and just make these really glib comments. You know, do this, do that. And, and you're exactly spot on is that we really, it, the systems are so complex, it's extremely difficult to understand. On the other hand, ignoring the problem, which is an equal sin, is also taking place. I stood on the carbon dioxide observatory in the Hawaiian Islands, and I think that's the most striking graph I've ever seen, is the wigwag back and forth of CO2 from the first time they started measuring, I think it was 1972. I mean, it's just, it's regular as a clockwork. This last week we had a, a student looking for a job, and he's been studying plants and leaves, and from leaves in the past, you can really get a good proxy for how much CO2 there was in past times. And he looked at CO2 levels compared to then proxies on temperature. And there's just a very straight one-to-one -one correlation between how much CO2 was in the atmosphere in the past and the global temperature. I think all of us realize as CO2 goes up, I mean, there's just, there's no doubt that higher CO2 creates higher temperature. The question is, what are the actual effects in a climate model that higher temperature produces? Now, part of it is that we keep thinking that the globally warmed world, you've seen all the bad movies, or these big bad storm worlds, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's quite the opposite. You know, in global warming, the tropics can't get much warmer, but the poles get a lot warmer. And so that hot to cold that we have now is hot to pretty hot, which slows things down. You slow down the current systems. You slow down. I studied Cretaceous rocks for a very long time, and most Cretaceous sediments are just donkey black shale because it was a globally warmed world with no currents. There's no storms, there's no super storms. It's just hot, muggy, no circulation. That's, I think, the inevitable consequence. Now getting there, we can't predict how we're gonna get there. Once we get there, we have a pretty good idea of what's gonna look like, because we see it all around us in the rocks. We know what CO2 does. We know what high CO2 has done in the Eocene. Oregon was an absolute tropical paradise. And we had 1,000 ppm carbon dioxide at that time. We know the CO2 levels, we know the animals. You're right, I can stand here and be glib, but on the other hand, I think it's a crime to do what the United States government is doing right now. Nothing. Right.